Welcome everyone to our second session of BU's Road to Washington panels. Uh, Road to Washington is a series developed by the College of Arts and Sciences and College of Communication to provide insight to the election for BU's faculty, staff, students, and alumni. I'm Toby Berkowitz, Associate Professor of Advertising in the College of Communication, where I teach a course in political campaigning, and I worked for 30 years as a political media consultant. When we created Road to Washington series last fall, we worried that there wouldn't be enough to talk about once we got into March. So I would like to say thank you, Super Tuesday. Obviously, uh, we have plenty left to, uh, to talk about. Uh, so our conversation today is being live streamed through the Alumni Association's US stream page. And we're pleased to welcome the viewers across the country and across the world. Uh, if you'd like to participate uh, via Ustream, simply share your questions on the page's wall, and the page is being monitored and questions will be relayed to our panelists. I'd like to welcome our panelists for this afternoon's program, and then I'll hand the mic over to them. To my left, uh, to your right, is Gina Sapiro, Dean of the College of uh, Dean of the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. She's a political scientist with decades of experience analyzing elections, public opinion, political communication, and political landscape as an expert on political psychology and political behavior. She is one of the foremost scholars on gender and politics. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, she also served as the director of the American National Election Studies, the benchmark survey study of American electorate that has been running since 1948. Next to her is Dr. Douglas Kreiner, an assistant professor of political, political science and the director of the undergraduate studies in the Department of Political Science. His research interests include American political institutions, separation of powers, the American military policy making. The author of two books on socioeconomic inequalities of war and the role of Congress in major military actions, Professor Kreiner's work has also appeared in the Journal of, of Politics, British, uh, the British Journal of Political Science, Public Opinion Quarterly, and Boston University Law Review. Professor Kreiner's teaching interests include courses on the presidency, Congress, domestic, domestic politics, and the use of force and separation of powers. And on the end is Dr. Tammy Vigil, the Associate Dean of the College of Communication. Dean Vigil has taught courses on communication theory, communication research methods, oral presentation, and contemporary mass communication at both the graduate and undergraduate levels. Her own research focuses on rhetorical analysis of political communication and popular culture. Dr. Veal is co-author of the book, The Third Agenda in US P P Presidential Debates. So now I'd like to start with Dean Sapiro. Gina? OK, thank you. And thank you, those of you who are here. And thank you, thank you who are on all the ships at sea. Um, I want to make a four, I think, brief points. One is about what's going on in the Republican Party, why we see the rift we see and what's it about. Um, the second thing is I want to stick with the question of differences and divides and talk about some of the deep divides within American political culture that I think uh, this season is revealing for us, what's new, what's old. Um, third is I want to take a case in point, which is how we use the word freedom and how we can see that while we all may use the word freedom and want freedom, that we have some really deep divides about what that's about and how we use that term. And finally, uh, segue into um, the so-called war on women as an example and what's going on. So first of all, what's going on in the Republican Party? Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of disagreement going on. We have different candidates who take different stands and people talk about this as left and right or uh, economic issues versus religious issues. I think there's something structural about the Republican Party that we have to pay attention to. And that is something that happened over the years is the Republican Party has become a coalition party. Um, and that's something structural we have to understand. Once upon a time, as you'll recall, the Democrats could shoot themselves in the foot any day of the week because they had so many different pieces of the Democratic Party 
all of whom basically didn't get along together. Lots of different important parts of the Democratic Party probably wouldn't want to sit down and have dinner together. But during the New Deal coalition in the 30s and the 40s, what happened was a number of different segments of the population with some converging interests were pasted together by that New Deal coalition. And we saw it hold together just enough to keep Congress Democratic for a long time and, and to come up with some years of a Democratic president. But that coalition began to fall apart very seriously in the 1960s to partly to race politics, partly to the war, and to some other issues uh, where we saw by 1972 the Democratic Party going off into all sorts of weird extremes and, and having difficulty holding itself together after that. The Republican Party, for much of the time that we can do public opinion polling and look at its base, and we always want to talk about the base, for much of the 20th century, um, the Republican Party was a very homogeneous party. Yeah, there were people of all sorts in different ways, but when you look at its base, the base of the Republican Party did not vary a whole lot by religion, by demography, by, by their views. That began to change especially as they benefited from the breakdown of the Democratic Party. They gained, for example, the former, much of the former Democratic South became Republican. They gained some of the uh, more conservative ethnic groups that had been within the Democratic Party, and so on and so forth with the rise of evangelicalism and so forth. What I think we see now is the real flowering of the Republican Party looking the way the Democratic Party did for a long time. A lot of different groups who have to converge together to keep their electoral strength, but it consists of a bunch of people who, once again, would probably rather not sit down for dinner together. And so the question, electorally and structurally, is how do they keep this thing together? And we're watching them having that difficulty. So second is another aspect of, of uh, our rift. Uh, some of you here, I can tell by looking at some white hair, will remember the culture wars of the 1980s and the 1990s. We are seeing that coming back again in spades. I think the rift within our political culture is deeper and broader than ever. I think we've reached a point, uh, for a reason I'll mention in a second, that not only do we have deep disagreements in politics, political culture, values, and so forth, but increasingly, I think that parts of the population are living in such different kind of political culture worlds that we barely understand each other. We barely understand each other's worldview. It is a struggle. Uh, to see the world from that other point of view, if you're, say, on, if you're one of those people who's worried about whether maybe Obama has moderated too much, um, and then you're one of the people who's saying, you know, go Rick, go, or uh, go Newt, go. You know, you think about those worldviews, and they are so different, we have trouble understanding each other. And I think there are a number of reasons for that, and a lot of that I'll leave to Tammy, because I think she, she would have the answer, but it has a lot to do with what's happened about the way we communicate each other and with each other and where we get our information. We no longer have to listen to anybody with whom we disagree. We can be very well informed, we think, and do the 24-hour news circuit and be on Twitter and do all those kinds of things and seem to get lots of news, but we don't have to listen to a single soul who has a fact that disagrees with us, and I think that's driven us apart. So that's the second thing. An example, use the word freedom. Um, probably just about everybody in this country agrees they like the idea of freedom. But what does that mean to us? When I say I want to protect my freedoms, does that mean I don't want Obamacare telling me what kind of health care I want? I don't want to have to live next to people I don't want to live next to. I don't want to help support people living a lifestyle I don't want them to live. Uh, I don't want people interfering with my church or my culture. Or does my protection of freedom mean I don't want you telling me who I can marry and not I don't want you telling me what kind of intimacy life I, I should have. I don't want you interfering with my reproductive rights. Just taking those examples, we agree on freedom. We disagree a lot on what that means. 
And then finally, we're seeing that in spades in the case of the discussion of things like contraception and abortion. Uh, no matter how you stand on the issue, I think a lot of us um, can't believe that once again we're having a discussion about uh, contraception, a serious discussion about the availability of contraception. It's just very, very hard to believe that. But to be able to speak over the airwaves about um, women, whether they should work, what they should do, their sexuality, uh, shows that we're in a different place. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. Doug? Thank you again, everyone, for, for coming and having me here uh, as well. So I'd like to just sort of start off with a few words that may seem a little contrarian to all the campaign watchers out there. Uh, specifically, I'm not sure that it matters who the Republicans nominate in 2012 in terms of affecting how this election is going to turn out in November. And that includes the possibility that Sarah Palin does indeed you know, emerge victorious in the brokered convention. I think, if I read correctly between the lines last night, she is willing to serve, you know, if asked. So, um, <clears throat> and so where does this come from? Uh, within political science, there's kind of this little cottage industry uh, of scholars that like to uh, create these things called forecast models. And forecast modelers are quite proud, really, of, of their work. And what they seem to have been able to do is that they have an impressive record uh, of predicting the winner and actually the margin of victory uh, with data that is taken about the state of the world before the conventions. Uh, and they do a better job, for the most part, in most years, of predicting how that election is going to turn out in November uh, than polls that are taken on election eve. Uh, <clears throat> and so that would suggest, at least a possibility, that sort of a lot of the campaign dynamics, who sighs, Right? Who doesn't sigh? Whether uh, you know, someone can pronounce the names of foreign leaders or cannot pronounce the names of foreign leaders. You know, all of, who gets into a tank or who doesn't get into a tank? Now, all of these sorts of campaign things that, that Saturday Night Live sort of has emblazoned in our memories right, by watching them being parodied may not have all that much of an influence. Um, <clears throat> And I think that there, there's some real truth to that. Uh, and so one way of just sort of exploring this is I'd like to do a, a real quick comparative example uh, of 2012 and where we are right now with another election that uh, is actually the first one that I don't remember. I guess I was five during it, uh, 1984. But I will jump off the, uh, jump off the deep end and, and talk to you for a little bit about the Gipper. You can all punch him in the arm later for that comment. <laughs> so. It's interesting, right? Here we are in 2012, and it's hard to escape invocations of the words Ronald Reagan. Right? You know, for, for months, we have watched a sequence of men and women declare themselves to be the, the next Gipper, right? They all want to be seen as the faithful son of the Reagan Revolution. After South Carolina, Newt Gingrich you know, had to defend himself, right? Because he had portrayed himself as Reagan's right-hand man, who may have been even more responsible for the revolution than the president himself. And he has to defend himself against comments that he allegedly made you know, denigrating uh, the previous Republican president. Yet I would argue uh, that if there's one candidate who truly wants to be Ronald Reagan this time around, that candidate is actually Barack Obama. Since World War II, we have had four presidents seek re-election with an unemployment rate over 7%. 1976, 1980, 1984, and 1992. <laughs> Only one of those candidates succeeded in winning re-election, and that's President Reagan. Um, <clears throat> given the ultimate popular vote landslide, right? if I just go on to uh, a database and look, at the, and look at the final outcomes, I see a big popular win, a huge electoral win, and I sort of remember Walter Mondale as almost a laughable figure, given how badly he got beaten. It's hard to remember that in late 1983, early 1984, Ronald Reagan looked very eminently beatable. Uh, in 1983, towards the end, his approval rating was below 50%, that sort of magic number, right? You know, presidents above it tend to win, and presidents below it almost always lose. Um, <clears throat> he had succeeded in 1981, of course, in passing a, a key part of his program, dramatic tax cuts that were supposed to trickle down and stimulate the engine of economic growth. And what he got was a very sharp uh, recession in 1982. And in 1984, the president, early 1984, the president suffered a very embarrassing defeat in foreign policy uh, when he had to pull American Marines out of uh, Lebanon uh, following months of sort of congressional pressure after the Beirut barracks bombing of 1983, which was, on his watch, the deadliest day for the United States Marine Corps since they raised the flag at Iwo Jima. 
uh, Reagan looked beatable. How did he transform this? How did he turn it around? Um, the economy seems like it can't be the answer, right? I mean, he had a, a seven uh, plus percent unemployment rate. And yet, when you sort of look deeper, uh, perhaps James Carville really is right. Maybe it is the economy stupid in presidential elections. Um, one of the major themes of the Reagan campaign in 84 was that it's morning in America. Right? We heard that again and again. It was used uh, routinely as a slogan by the, uh, by the administration, despite the high unemployment levels. But when you look at the data, it seems that many Americans believed him. Uh, so there are multiple ways in which we can measure the economy. Uh, and that is indeed what separates most of these forecast models from one another, is what's the magic way of thinking about the economy? What is the one that gives us the best insight uh, into the strength of, of the country and how voters feel? Uh, and so unemployment is just one metric. In fact, it's one that's almost never used by forecasters to try and predict how an election is going to turn out. Another one that is sometimes used is this measure called the index of consumer sentiment. Uh, and it measures how the public thinks the economy is doing, both in the immediate uh, and their projections about how they think it's going to happen in the future. And on that respect, when we look at those numbers, people did believe it was morning in America. The labor market hadn't totally picked up yet, but people saw light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and indeed, Reagan was propelled to a fairly easy re-election. So where does this leave President Obama? As of January 2012, the unemployment rate sits at 8.3%, higher than it was in 1984. And as of February, the University of Michigan's Index of Consumer Sentiment had risen to a 12-month high. However, its raw level remains far below uh, the level of consumer confidence that existed in 1984. And in fact, the closest parallel uh, is where George H.W. Bush uh, had a level of index of consumer sentiment in 1992 when he lost to President Clinton. So a lot can happen uh, in the intervening eight months. We've seen pretty big swings in terms of uh, how the public feels about the health of the economy. But I would argue that history suggests that consumer con confidence, and whether it grows or fades, over the next few months may well be the key factor that determines uh, whether or not President Obama is granted another four year in office, not whether it's Mitt Romney or how much money he can raise uh, or how much money uh, the opposition spends as well. So. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, a little sidebar, when Doug was five, I'd been working for 10 years as a political media consultant. <laughs> so let's uh, now move over to uh, Tammy V. Hill. And I was a little older than five at that point in time, <laughs> but, but not much, let's just say. Okay. Uh, well, hello, Steubenville. Welcome. Uh, did I mention we're in Steubenville? And I was actually in the weight room in the gym at Steubenville in what we called the war room, but was really the weight room in the high school gym at Steubenville. Uh, yes, if you didn't actually have the chance to, to listen to it, you both basically heard the bulk of Rick Santorum's speech last night. Uh, so the idea here is that I've been really fascinated with the, I, I do rhetorical analysis, so I like to listen to people. Sometimes it's a little painful, but sometimes, you know, you get a lot of interesting things out of it. Lately, my uh, preoccupation has been with the idea of identification. Uh, Michael Leff and, and Gerald Mormon once argued, the ultimate goal of the campaign orator is to promote himself as a candidate. Both policies and character are in question, but the treatment of issues is subsidiary to the purpose of creating a general identification between the speaker and the audience. So when I'm watching particularly the GOP race, but I've been doing this since, well, there's a big story from the, the 2008 campaign. But the idea is that the candidates are really trying to connect emotionally, personally with the audience. They want the audience to feel as though they have this consubstantial bond, that they know them personally. They know their story. They know what it's like to be the average person. Right? So they do do these kinds of things in their speeches, like talk about Steubenville and the gym in Steubenville and how nobody else is coming here, but I'm coming here because I know who you are. I am one of you. Yes, I have a PhD. Yes, I have a JD. Yes, I have $213 million, but I'm like you. And so what they do is they use a lot of strategies to get the audience to identify and identify with them. 
as candidates. Now, this is usually a pretty good strategy to use. You want people to think that you understand their needs because then they will vote for you. This is pretty simple, pretty direct. It's not exactly earth-shattering kinds of knowledge. We've been doing this for a very, very long time. In fact, Aristotle really wrote a lot about it. So it's kind of, you know, I'm not, not telling you anything new. But what happens is when I'm looking at the race this year, I'm thinking, why? Why are the GOP candidates having such a hard time connecting with the Republicans? And the reason I think gets back to what Gina was saying earlier, and that is there are so many different labels of Republicans, so many different flavors. So what you end up having is this really strange rhetorical choice where you either can be consistent and take your lumps by not actually winning a lot because you're not connecting to the base, or you can adapt a lot. And then you end up taking your lumps by being called a flip-flopper and not being able to be consistent and then having your, uh, your actual standings and your moral abilities, or well, I shouldn't say abilities, but your, your actual belief structures questioned over and over again. And we see this in the, in the cam candidates. For example, we've got Ron Paul. Ron Paul, I think, has been the most consistent of candidates in terms of his message. He knows that he's the idea guy. He knows he's probably not going to win, but he thinks it's important to get his message out there. Essentially, what we have is Ron Paul, who is the third-party candidate, getting a lot more attention than he ever would as a third-party candidate by staying in the Republican race. So he's getting to actually have his speeches televised. He gets to participate in debates. In debates. So he's actually using the strategy of staying, of identifying as a Republican and trying to connect with that base, when in reality he's basically drawing on the, the independents that are voting all over the place. Right? So he knows who he is. He hasn't really veered. He's one of the few people who would actually say, no, you shouldn't be insured, and if you die, you die. The others say, no, you shouldn't be insured, but, you know, saying you're going to die is not really popular with this particular demographic, so I'm going to alter my message somewhere else. So he's been the most consistent, Ron Paul, in terms of his rhetorical strategy and his rhetorical content. Um, Rick Santorum has also been pretty re rhetorically consistent, but his message has alienated great parts of the vast parts of the of the actual Republican Party. Everybody, it's kind of an interesting thing because the strategies that a lot of people are talking about is vote for Santorum if you're a Democrat, so that he's the easiest guy to beat when it comes to November for uh, Barack Obama. So it's a different kind of strategy in terms of his support and his support base. It's either that or you've got the extreme sort of right side of the Republicans, of the GOP, that tend to support him as well because they have uh, identified with his fear appeals. The fear of people are picking on you. If you are religious, people pick on you. If you believe in certain things, people pick on you. Vote for me because then I will be a leader that won't pick on you. I will save our country from this brink that we are on of falling over a moral cliff, right? Uh, and so people who believe in that really tend to support him as well. He's been consistent, but he's also been alienating. Then we have Romney, and we're going to skip over Newt Gingrich because he's just a whole other ball of mess but for a number of reasons. We can get to that when we start talking about the, the give and take. Uh, but when we get to Romney, Romney sort of has the other problem where Romney is the consummate politician. He knows he needs to adapt to his audience. The problem is the audience is so fractured that every time he adapts, he becomes fractured. He is then seen as inconsistent because his policy or his messages are really inconsistent. He is the guy who passed Romney care. But at the same time, he's going to repeal Obamacare. But Obamacare is Romneycare. Uh, so it becomes a little confusing. He is for this, but he may not be if, you know, the next audience, if, if Ohio's for it, he's for it. If Kentucky's not, he's not. If Colorado is, well, let's not even get into Colorado because they were a little nutty this time around. So that's my home state, so I can actually uh, say that. But the idea is that he's adapted a little too much. And last night's speech by Romney I thought was really fascinating because Romney then took on not Reagan's persona, 
but actually more of a Clintonian persona. When he was speaking last night, I couldn't help but see the shades of Clinton when he talked about things like, I met a man named Bob in Walsenburg, Colorado, and he is a miner that uh, also invests in blah, blah, blah. And he's really concerned with whatever, whatever you might be concerned with next. And so that really is something that Clinton did incredibly well. It actually, there were some, some streaks of that beforehand, but Clinton really picked up that rhetorical strategy and it worked really well for him. It worked really well for Obama in 2008 as well, and Romney is really hoping that it'll work for him too. The question is, we're not really sure if it will at this point in time because it's yet another Romney. So with that, I think it's time to open up for some questions. I'll pass it along and we can get you all involved. Great. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. And now it's going to be your turn. Uh, we have microphones. Please wait till you have a microphone to ask your question. And please make your question be in the form of a question uh, rather than a partisan harangue. So who has the first question? Who has the second question? <laughs> there we go. OK. Go going forward, the remaining states, who do you see those states favoring? Uh, for the rest of Republican uh, primaries. Romney wins. <laughs> Santorum has a couple of southern states coming up, which will be helpful for him. You know, I don't know that Gingrich, even though Alabama is right next door and he tried to emphasize some of, during his speech, some of his Alabama connections last night, I, I think that the writing is on the wall for anyone and strategic voting will deliver it for for Santorum, but Santorum has a little bit of a, of a nice respite before he has to get into some of the big states where he can't compete with the, the Romney money machine. Yeah, I think Santorum gets maybe one or two more golds and then a lot more silver as he kind of keeps going along, so. Okay, someone else please, okay. Oh, wait, wait for the microphone, whoa, whoa, could you wait for the microphone please, thank you. I haven't seen much compromise or moderation dominating much of this uh, primary season. Do you think uh, that that's related in large part or not much at all to the super PAC uh, the novelty that just entered the political scene? We've seen some sequential moderation and change from Romney, you know, as Tammy says, depending on <coughs> which state he's in, so he might moderate further to the extreme or to the center. Um, traditionally, we don't see a lot of moderation in primaries, uh, but this year's a, a little bit different because it's going on longer than usual. The, the moderation we usually see is when you've got two candidates and they're trying to run to pick up whatever is in the center. And these, these folks, where they tend to speak and find find their best audiences, they can't moderate. They have to, they have slightly different bases and they have to move to those different bases, I think. I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think? I, I agree, I think the moderation idea is, we like to see that, I think we tend to like to see them coming together and right now we're seeing them actually pulling apart a little bit more and pulling each other apart a little bit more. Uh, and so I think part of it is really about the bases. Part of it really is, I think, like for instance, Newt Gingrich right now, I think he's running a campaign that's very much, if I can't have the nomination, I'm going to do everything I can to not let Romney have it. And I'm going to sort of try and tear it apart. And he's doing a pretty good job of that with his super PAC money. Well, not that he's coordinating, because we all know super PACs can't coordinate with their, uh, their actual candidates, uh, but I think that's really part of it. I think the super PACs are one part. I think the other part is trying to find the base. And the Tea Party rise and now the sort of questions about the Tea Party also are, are influential on that as well, on that front. Okay. I mean, we've really become sort of obsessed, obviously, with the primary season, but I think the smarter thing to do is look down the road towards September, or October uh, in the general election, and then real questions are, or might be, well, have the Democrats done any compromising? I mean, they've essentially gotten a buy through a lot of this, and if you look at most of the debates, every once in a while that Obama guy will come up, but uh, the Republicans have spent much more time, I think, just pummeling each other, and so I, I think it's really gonna be important down the road, the whole question in American politics is, um, either 
going to the base, which we've been seeing and happens in most primaries, versus some form of pragmatism. And you had talked about Bill Clinton a little earlier. And I mean, one of the most fascinating things about Clinton, besides his just superb touch and rapport dealing with, with ordinary people, uh, was he became exceedingly pragmatic. Uh, and that was, to a large degree, I think, part of, part of his political success. So we'll sort of have to see as things move along. OK. Uh, Uh, you, you, some of you suggested that you're pretty sure Romney will win uh, the Republican nomination. Uh, what do you uh, predict that uh, Obama will do as he pre uh, prepares for the general election or how he will run against uh, Romney? He'll pray that the economy continues to get better. That's his best solution. And, and also, I think Obama has been blessed with overall very positive mainstream media coverage. And then again, when we get to the fall, the question will be, will that continue uh, or will the media become more aggressive? And we'll have to see. And this doesn't even start to open up the role of all the new media, uh, whether it's the new media blogs and websites, Twitter, Facebook, and all of these things as well. Why don't we go down here for our next question? Hi, um, I was just wondering if you think Ron Paul will end up running as an independent candidate and what that will do for independent voters. <laughs> Who wants to grab that third rail? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, he did resign his house seat, right? So I mean, he's got, yeah, th th this is his shot if he, if he wants to do it. I, it is a real question. You know, I, I think that, that uh, Professor Vigil is exactly right, that you know, he, he's staying in the race, he's getting all of this coverage for, uh, for his message that he wouldn't otherwise receive by remaining in the Republican tent. You know, uh, will he do it 50-50? And certainly, I think it's, um, you know, it's a, a real dramatic uh, development should he decide to run. Uh, you know, for precisely the reasons Professor Berkovitz said, you know, uh, one of the nice things for Obama is that he can camp out in the center right now. Uh, I would say that's what, what sunk Hillary Clinton in the last primary is that she tried to camp out right in the center because she was looking toward the general election and Obama swooped in on her left and she couldn't get left quick enough and, and she lost. But Obama doesn't have a primary challenge, so he's sitting there. And once Mitt Romney wins, he's going to try and be Governor Romney again, as opposed to candidate Romney. Uh, and if he's got to worry about Ron Paul, then that's going to keep him a little bit further right, I think, than he would otherwise be. And it would be a huge development. Yeah, I think uh, as far as Ron Paul's concerned, when he, he, we know he definitely pulls mostly from the independents, and that was a big uh, area for Obama in the last election. So there'll be a lot of questions in terms of, a, how much do the, the mainstay GOP folks actually forgive Romney for his being sort of moderate, and will they actually support him? B, whether or not uh, Obama actually has to swing a little more left, and then C, whether or not the independents, where they all end up landing. Uh, so I think there are a lot of big questions that come up. The other thing I think that kind of also gets back to the previous question is the idea of when the uh, Republicans actually solve their dilemma. If it actually runs all the way to the uh, convention, which is exactly what Santorum and Gingrich both hope, they're going to have a lot of problem then shifting gears because it'll take some time to actually rebuild the unity that they need to rebuild as a party, get the support of the people who have been so divided for so long uh, to actually go behind one candidate. And so that could become a bit of an is interesting uh, problem for the Republicans that then could benefit both Ron Paul and Obama, ultimately, I think, Obama. These questions raise, I think, something else that we have to begin to turn to that has to do with the the electoral strategy, and that is the issue of turnout in the general. That is how many people are actually going to go and vote. And I think that that's going to be a big issue, and that's going to be one of the major question marks. Uh, it's, it's clear that while you have small groups of people excited over some of the Republican candidates, it's not really excitement we're seeing. In By and large, it's kind of making this choice among people where, where a lot of folks aren't sure, and the the support is really kind of superficial. Um, likewise, what Obama had in his favor in the last election is he managed to gin up incredible excitement in many ways. And so turnout was especially large, and turnout was large in groups that don't usually go out and vote as much in, <clears throat> for example, among the young, among African Americans and others, where he was able to get the turnout up. 
Um, if if uh, Obama's not exciting his former group the way he might, and we can be pretty sure Romney's not going to support, uh, and is not going to excite a lot of people, we could have a very quiet election, and that will do odd things. It will interact also with the local state and House races and the Senate races and so forth, and it will have differential kind of impact in different parts of the state. It'll suppress the vote in some areas, and that's going to make a big difference for the candidates. Yeah, Gina's absolutely right, and those of us who are teaching here at Boston University can see the difference from how students looked at Obama four years ago. I always uh, call it the, the, the laptop test, because all the, all the students had Obama bumper stickers on their laptops, and now there is absolutely no interest and no enthusiasm, and this goes to turning out the base, um, excitement uh, with the voters, and so there's a real difference there, and you can see Obama very aggressively trying to court um, working class. Um, he, I think he's going to become much more active uh, courting African Americans. Obviously, Hispanic Americans are a significant target um, for the Obama campaign. And so how will these groups either be activated or not, uh, as Gina pointed out, is going to be very important. And also, it'll reflect on congressional races, Senate races, and that's, that's also a huge part of our electoral landscape. Uh, okay. Uh, I'd like to look a little further down the road, even past this election, because I see the Republican Party push right, push right. I think they're alienating a lot of the independent vote. What happens after this? Is it going to realign? Will the Republican Party move back more toward the middle, or will the right side, the right wing of the Republican Party, continue to be the controlling factor, Tea Party, whatever? <laughs> yeah, put on the prognosticator hat. <laughs> I think it's a great question. You know, one of the things I do immediately is look back and say, how how did the Democrats uh, recover as as they did in that point? And um, it was it was really hard. And that's going into the Clinton era uh, of of how did it regain its its center to some degree? A, a lot of fighting, a lot of knife fighting in the party, frankly. I think what's going to have to happen is the leaders of the party, many of whom are really quite disgusted with this year, have to caucus somewhere, maybe in the back rooms of the convention or maybe in one of those great bars in Washington, um, and figure out what they're going to do to arm wrestle their party back to to more toward the center. Although they don't want to lose all these coalitions, it's really it's really a matter of how are they going to live in this new coalition era and, and keep it together but but move to a more central position. And it's hard to know exactly what that strategy is. I think it usually takes a very strong, smart leader, um, you know, the Roosevelt, the Clinton, the others who were just politically really smart about pulling it together. I would say until the threat of a Tea Party schism goes away, you're not going to see any movement. Uh, you know, go back even earlier if you want to look at Democrats. You know, think about Democrats co-opting the populist movement in the 1890s. You know, they could not afford to have you know that part of the base forever cleaved off into an autonomous unit. Uh, and so, you know, cooler heads will not prevail until they're pretty sure that Tea Party legislators and the rest will obey what a Speaker Boehner tells them to do. If Speaker Boehner cuts a a, a grand deal with uh, with the president or or something like that. You're also starting to see more talk um, among sort of Republican strategists that maybe the best thing for the Republican Party is a debacle and then let the Republican Party really figure out what they want to do. And this sort of goes back to what happened in um, Democratic presidential campaigns, 84, 88. A lot of people thought you just sort of had to get that out of your system in order to get a 1992 and a Bill Clinton with, with his form of coalition building pragmatism in the, in the party. And I think it's it's interesting because I, I agree with Gina. I think what they're going to need is a leader. They're going to need somebody who's really a dynamic leader who can can pull people together. They don't have that right now. Uh, but also one of the problems that they have currently is if they push too far in terms of trying to create to to push 
to force people to, to step in line at this point in time, they are going to end up alienating a large group. They are going to end up pushing the, the, the breakup rather than actually the coming together. So they need a unifying character. They just, that, that who that is on the horizon, we just don't know. And it might take some time and a few cycles to get there. A debacle, I think, would definitely sort of push them toward that and even the discussions right now when they're saying really this is the best field of candidates we can actually put out there those kinds of questions are starting to rise up and so you know when they start looking to, to new candidates on the horizon that's going to be the question we're going to have a cleanup in the house and the senate too um you know notice we've got some churn going on there a generation of republicans uh, um who are who are saying look even though we're in pretty good shape now i'm, I'm out of here i can't do this anymore and um, I, I think that's probably in our future discussions, we really need to turn to talking about those Senate and House races and so forth, because, you know, that is going to be very important. That may generate a lot of the excitement in various areas, and, and somewhere out there uh, are, are the next generations of, of leaders that we're looking for who are campaigning now to get to Washington. And now we have our moment of silence for Dennis Kucinich, who just lost his primary. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes. The gentleman in the front. The gentleman in the front. Uh-oh. Um, no, no, I, I, you, uh, you mentioned, Dean Sapir, you mentioned the war on women in your comments there, and uh, which I think has really come to the fore in the last week with the whole Rush Limbaugh issue, and of course it was simmering along with uh, the Sandorum campaign somewhat with uh, contraception as an issue. But I, uh, what, what I wonder is how can this um, uh, show itself? How will it be revealed in the campaign? Can President Obama use this as a campaign issue? And um, can the Republicans recover from that? And I say that because Ronald Reagan, uh, in even though going into 84, he was a staunch opponent of the ERA. He was certainly opposed to reproductive rights for women. And, uh, and you had Geraldine Ferraro as Walter Mondale's running mate. So there was a great hope, I think, on the Democrats' part that they could win the women's vote and that that would work to their favor. It didn't happen. And uh, so I'm wondering if the Democrats might not be uh, able to convert this war on women to their uh, benefit. That's, that's great. Um, what Dean Fiedler is, is really asking a question that, that shows how um, these issues about things like women, women's rights, sexuality, reproduction, do not cut in only one direction, and they do not cut in only one direction about, among women. Research shows again and again that women break into two parties. They break across all of these different views. Um, and usually when we've had the gender gap, when we do our analysis of what's teasing that difference between men and women in the same party apart, it is not those traditional so-called women and feminist issues. It's often things that have to do with core economic issues and, and that kind of thing. When I looked at the exit poll uh, figures yesterday um, and to see what was going on, the first thing to know is something I would expect from research I've done, which is if you look at the different states, you see the gender differences breaking differently in different states. So the most important thing always to know is you're not just talking about women and men, you're talking about people who live in different states, different cultures, and so forth. So in some places, uh, like Ohio, you get a gender gap coming up, which looks not just like women were more in favor of Romney than men, which they were in Ohio, but single women. They are, you know, they do not want the alternatives they're seeing. Um, and so you see a big difference, single men, single women, married men and women um, breaking on, on these issues. Look at Tennessee, look at some of the other states, not so much. Uh, there it might be married people. You're getting people in a different kind of situation. So what does that mean for strategy? Obama has to get his base back. Um, and that would be certain kinds of young people. It would be women, um, single women especially. But he can't speak that so loudly that he really gets the Republicans to say, see, he doesn't believe in our morals. And so I think there's a really interesting tightrope they have to walk so that Obama can get those people who should, who should be excited because they're afraid. 
And fear is much better than positive stuff. Hope aside, it's much better than positive stuff to get people out. But at the same time, he could help the Republican candidate by seeming to support the view that he is some wide-eyed radical who's going to interfere with your ability to have a moral culture. I, the other thing, I mean, we're, we're focusing a lot, and obviously the campaign has focused a lot on gender, uh, reproductive rights, and we've gone into these social issues. But if you go back four years, one of the great qualifiers for how people voted was, do they attend church? And we frequently don't pay enough attention to that, and that could also play a huge role uh, and varies from, from state to state, uh, religion to religion. And when you look at who voted for McCain, who voted for Obama, uh, one of the one of the things that really defined people was do they attend church? And this this piles on but adds another thing. If you look at the exit polls from yesterday, you can you can see in a lot of states, though not all states, something else, which is the question really is, do you go to church and how fundamentalist you are? Because because in a number of places the Catholic vote is going more for Romney than Santorum. So whereas you might think uh, if you just look at it, that Santorum is appealing to Catholics. He's not. He's appealing more to Protestant evangelicals, mm -hmm. churchgoers, people where this is this is life. Gentleman over there. In terms of the, what's going on right now, all these social issues and so forth are in the forefront. Going forward, if consumer price or the consumer confidence is not going up for Obama, what is the arena going to be in terms of him and the Republicans? And what are the issues? Will the social issues predominate? And Obama will have to respond because using your matrix, if the consumer confidence is not going up, that's indicating he's in big trouble. So what will be the issue going forward? Well, what, is this going to be a, right now what we're going through is a, a lot of sound and fury doesn't mean anything, or will this be with Obama and whoever the Republican candidate is going to define the, the election and what goes on. I think this race will pivot. You know, uh, either way, right? Uh, if if the economy looks good, then Obama's going to want to talk about nothing but that and killing Osama bin Laden, right? Uh, and you know, if the economy looks bad, then Mitt Romney's going to want to talk about nothing but the economy. And honestly, regardless of what happens, I think Mitt Romney is going to feel much more comfortable discussing uh, economic management than he is social issues, um, not, to mind, you know, not the least of which because he's bounced all over depending on which race he's uh, running in a, at any given time. So I think you're exactly right that sort of, I don't know if it's sound and fury, but it's just they're two totally different electorates with two totally different sets of concerns. And when we shift from one to the other, the, the contours of the race will change. Anyone else? Um, I, we have a few minutes left, so let me pose one other issue that I think no one has really talked about, and we sort of have talked about religion in just, that's the role of Mormonism and how that has played. Um, certainly, I think it's it's been an important undercurrent in the Republican primaries, and how does that go on? I mean, whether we look at this rhetorically, we look at how the media covers it, how voters look at this. Anyone want to touch that one? <laughs> and Next. Everybody's looking on my side, I'm like, ah. Uh, well, I think it, it's an interesting thing because religion and politics has always been, as much as we've got the, the uh, separation of church and state, it's not really ever separated. And we've had for such a long time a, a tradition of, of looking at and talking about the candidate's religion. Uh, you know, back from when uh, when Kennedy had to, to defend his Catholicism, will you answer to the Pope or will you do what's good, you know, would he answer to the Constitution? Uh, the idea of being a Quaker was an issue for a while. Uh, so the idea is that it always comes up. Last, last go round, it was, are you really a Muslim? Or, no, no, you, you have Reverend Wright, but you're still really a Muslim, aren't you? Uh, yeah, there's this controversy, and we don't really always deal with those uh, quite, quite effectively. Um, in this particular case, the, the Mormon issue, I think there's, a, there's sort of a, a question. I, I haven't... I don't think it's really as as big. I think as as Gina was pointing out, you know, the, the Catholics tend to have been tending to vote for uh, Romney. Uh, so I think it's really about are you religious more 
in this particular primary season than it is necessarily what religion are you. Although granted, if you pr probably ran off and you were doing something totally extreme, that would be something different. But it's really about are you a recognizable kind of Christian fellow? Uh, and I think that's really what the question is at this, at this point, at this juncture. I think there are little pockets where that probably made a difference, but my sense is that that in the end, because of of um, how much traction a lot of these other religious issues and evangelicalism is having, that his Mormonism isn't having any much more impact than than Richard Nixon's being a Quaker. Right. I think yeah, I would agree with that. It's so exceedingly difficult to tell when you start sifting through the data because the people whom you would be most worried about if you're Romney and not accepting you for your faith are Southern evangelicals, and they have perfectly good reasons to already vote for Rick Santorum, uh, aside from the fact that you're, you know, uh, your own personal religious conviction. So, um, you know, I think you could remove that from the equation and it wouldn't change the outcomes at all. Okay. Thank, yes, we have one last, one last question. We have a, a minute or two, so. Uh, I know you're primarily speaking about the presidential campaign, but are any of you willing to comment on the Warren uh, Brown campaign? Take that? Oh, thank you. Uh, Gina <laughs> tossed that one to me. Um, I think what's most interesting right now, and again, the, if the elect, when you poll, you always say if the election were held today, but it isn't. The election is going to be held in November, is how quickly Warren came out of the box everything going her way, um, accolades from a lot of different areas, especially uh, areas who are not voting in Massachusetts, like the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, and then all of a sudden, and, and she opened up a nice little lead in the polls, now all of a sudden, Brown has sort of caught up and has taken a, a small lead. Uh, I wonder just how the voters in Massachusetts are going to position um, Warren, who came out of the box as an unabashed liberal, and Brown, who uh, has been very successful positioning himself as a moderate, independent Republican. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it's too early, but Brown is, is going to be much more to handle than I think people give him credit for. Yeah, in a democratic state like this, that it's so neck and neck even at this point yeah. and even with his incumbency tells you something. And, and I think the interaction with what happens over time, what happens um, in the presidential, this is going to be one where when we have our future conversations and this cooks a little bit more, I think that there are going to be some very interesting things for us to be talking about, about what's happening in this state um, and likewise what's happening in this state as a result of redistricting and so forth with our house races. And I think a lot of it will also be how does Elizabeth Warren really portray herself to the voters and to the media? She's been very lucky uh, sort of in a cocoon so far and that, ju that just isn't gonna last. Well, I think just kind of building off of that back to the point of identification I was talking about before, she hasn't really managed to give herself the same image that he has. He's done a really, Brown has done a really nice job of being every man, of being a common guy, of driving around in his pickup truck. And that's what did a really nice job for him in the special Senate election a couple of years back. Uh, he was the guy who actually knew who, who the Red Sox pitcher was and would stand out in front of Fenway Park and shake hands in the middle of the winter. Um, Although Fenway Park in the middle of the winter, I still never quite got that one. But the idea being that he it's was hockey. out there, he was doing those things. But uh, and and right now, I you know I, I heard a story the other day that was kind of amazing to me that you know they've done a really nice job of actually of of Brown saying he's still the common guy, every man, but of him portraying Warren as sort of an elitist even though she has more common background than he would or would be considered common background, and that she actually has sort of the, the you know, student loans, the working her way through college, she has the same or a very similar story to him, it's not portraying or it's not playing that well. She's not actually getting that point across to the electorate, and that creates a, a problem in their being able to connect with her and identify with her in the way that she probably wants them to, but Brown's doing a superb job of still maintaining that image. Being portrayed as a professor, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, uh, so uh, I'd like to thank um, everyone here in our audience, uh, to the viewers on Ustream, and particularly uh, thanks to our wonderful panel up here. Beautiful job.
We look forward to seeing you at the next installment of our series, and then the conversation will continue in the fall, and who knows what those are going to be like. So thank you. Thank you one and all.